I thought I would try and offer a few words. And for some reason, I was just pondering what what brings us to sit together. Very much a rhetorical question because uh, particularly now that we have sat, um, there's a, a recognition, I think, in the heart or in the guts of the real value of sitting together rather than um, keeping ourselves separate or unseen, keeping meditation as something that uh, is a private matter. There is something um, public and uh, extremely generous about sharing meditation, sharing our uh, vulnerability, sharing our limitations, sharing our circumstances. And generosity and gratitude are often spoken of as good indications that uh, the teaching of the Buddha is internalized, if you like, understood. Of course, there's all sorts of superficial reasons why we sit together, why we choose to sit together. Um, the phrase that came to mind for me is fathoming the unfathomable because that's what Zazen is. Sometimes meditation is spoken of metaphorically as an, as an ocean, the great ocean of the Dharma. And the great ocean is a, is a powerful metaphor. Even for us with our knowledge of, um, you know, Jacques Cousteau and his ilk, uh, diving to the depths of the Marianas Trench or wherever, still we have this image of a, a tiny um, submersible surrounded by darkness. The unfathomable vastness of the ocean is still uh, unfathomed, even though in one sense, scientifically, we know it still. The vastness of the ocean as a metaphor for the unfathomable vastness of, of the Dharma. And when we are apparently uh, flailing about on the surface of the, the waters of the great ocean, how much more so can it seem overwhelming, in fact, to even contemplate the great ocean? We sometimes thrash about on the surface because we are unwilling or unable to to sink deeper, to sink at all beyond the surface, to allow ourselves to lose the buoyancy of our um, opinions and reliances, dependencies. The, um, the crutches of our beliefs, of our, uh, of our reason, all of that we have to let go to sink beneath the surface. I think in a way we have to drown, to be willing to drown, to to fathom the unfathomable. And in that metaphorical drowning in meditation, when we breathe in the whole ocean of reality enters us, becomes one with us. And when we breathe out, when we are willing to to really let go, 
we dissolve, in fact, into that ocean of the Dharma. The boundaries that we have become long habituated to cease. They cease. They cease. So, Zazen is fathoming the unfathomable. I mentioned generosity. I think the generosity that comes from doing this is manifested through sharing the Dharma. All of us, each of us. We share our knowledge of the Buddha's teachings. And I'm, I'm constantly humbled when I uh, let other people speak. And I'm very happy to let other people speak that the... Uh, the quotations, the memory of passages of the Dharma that people bring forth uh, are often passages that I've forgotten or maybe I haven't even heard or just wasn't listening properly when someone else spoke about them. Maybe a Reverend Master did a lecture and I, I somehow didn't hear it. The generosity that is manifested in Zazen through sitting together is the sharing of our wish to train. That's very powerful. The sharing of our sincerity. You know, even to, to join this evening is a manifestation of great sincerity, of purpose. Sharing our doubt, too, is the, the bringing of an openness which is a great generosity. Of course, I never know who's going to come of an evening. And so um, putting thoughts together, it occurred to me that sometimes uh, what can bring people to sit is in some sense a seeking of affirmation from others for the fact that we may have fathomed the unfathomable to some extent previously. We may consider that we have. It's not the end of the world if we've fallen into that. Affirmation makes us feel good. Well, you know, we all want to feel good in one way or another. The letting go that Zazen draws from us involves letting go even of affirmation. We have to be willing to, well, not necessarily feel bad, but at least not feel good and not seek that uh, validation of self, because, of course, it's self that we're letting go. So I've spoken a bit about fathoming the unfathomable, um, what can bring people together to sit is unfathoming the fathomable. Uh, I have seen meditation used as a way of hiding, and I'm quite sure none of us are doing that. But it can happen. It can happen. And we may come into contact with people who we feel um, are, are doing just that, using meditation as a way of hiding ourselves or their, their self away from the very uh, fears and desires that drive them. So... Courage, in fact, is needed in the face of fear. Fear arises naturally and can often drive us, if not in the past, well, maybe tomorrow, maybe the day after. Reasonable fear, because not all fears are the dark, um, irrational, 
nightmarish fears. There's plenty of reasonable fears. I mean, really, at the moment, we're living in the midst of all manner of, of reasonable fears. There are so many permutations um, of consequences to the choices that we make and the choices that we, we don't make. It's not unreasonable to fear those consequences. And yet, if that fear drives us, then if we're not careful, meditation can be a way of unf unfathoming the fathomable. The heart knows that we can do this. And in Zazen, we did. We do, we did, we will. It does come back to letting go, to relinquishment, to renunciation. That is the, uh, the one thing, if you like, we come back to rather than seeking affirmation seek the ability to let go, to let go of this, to let go of hesitation, to let go of the belief in our inability to truly comprehend the Dharma. Sometimes we can convince ourselves that I can't do this, this is this is a bit much. It's it's too complicated. I just want somewhere comfortable. Wholehearted practice promises us, assures us that we can we can do this. We do have the ability, we do have the courage, we do have the necessary resolve and the the strength of of character somewhere to do this. And I'm reminded of the four Bodhisattva vows. However innumerable beings may be I vow to save them all. There is a, an unfathomable thought. However innumerable beings may be, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible the passions may be, I vow to transform them all. However limitless the Dharma may be, I vow to comprehend it completely. However infinite the Buddha's truth is, I vow to realize it. There were two short passages I found that I thought I would briefly read. I don't think they're too long. The first one is from the Lotus Sutra from a chapter called The Scripture on the Conduct that Eases the Way. The Buddha is speaking and the Buddha says, Further, when you do not act as if there were superior, middling and inferior dharmas, or as though things were material or independent of cause, real or unreal, when you do not make such distinctions as this is a man or this is a woman, and when you do not grasp after things, failing to recognize them because you do not discern them as desirable, this then is what is called a bodhisattva's perspective on practice. All that are called things are void of self-existence, having no permanence, neither arising nor perishing. This is what wise ones call a bodhisattva's perspective on relationships. Whereas those whose views are topsy-turvy decide by discrimination whether all things exist or do not exist, are real or unreal, produced or not produced. As for you, abide in seclusion, train and pacify your mind, dwelling peaceably in your meditation and immovable as Mount Sumeru, regarding all things as though they had no permanence, as if they were 
as insubstantial as space, lacking solidity, not arising or coming forth, but motionless and unreceding, ever remaining in their oneness. This is what is called the Bodhisattva's perspective on relationships. The second passage is from the scripture of the Buddha's last teaching. And the Buddha is speaking again. Oh, you monks. Oh, he's addressing monks, obviously. I think we could just change the word monks for trainees, really. But I'll read it as it is in the, in the translation here. Oh, you monks, if your mind plays around with all kinds of theories and opinions, it will be confused and in disorder. And though you have left home to be a monk, you have still not yet realized liberation. Therefore, O oh monks, quickly abandon your disordered mind and your playing around with your theories and notions. If you wish to enjoy the pleasure that comes from calmness and the extinction of defiling passions, thoroughly eliminate the affliction of playing around in your head. This is what I mean by not playing around with theories and opinions. O oh, you monks, you should wholeheartedly discard all forms of looseness and self-indulgence in favor of merits and virtues, just as you would keep away from a malicious thief. What the world-honored one desires with his great compassion is to benefit all by means of their ultimate realization of their identity with Buddha. Be it deep in the mountains, in an uninhibited, uninhabited valley, or under some tree, your place of seclusion is your abode of peace. Keep in mind what you have received of the teachings. Do not let yourself be forgetful of them and thereby lose them. Always be as diligent as possible in your practice and mastery of them. The unreality of the unconditioned after death spawns gloom and regret. Like a good physician, I understand illness and prescribe curatives for you to take. Not to take them is not the doctor's fault. I also resemble a skilled guide who leads others to a clear pathway. Not to heed him and not to travel the path is not the mistake of the guide. If you in your sufferings have any doubts about the Four Noble Truths, you can forthwith ask me about them, for to fail to eradicate your doubts is indeed to fail to seek for certainty. So I'm not sure if those passages entirely connected with what I was saying earlier, but I think I'd like to, to leave the talk there.